The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys. Today we are going to go through the top five ways to ruin a puppy. Ruin? Holy smokes. <laughs> it's a real uplifting topic, but a lot of people get puppies <clears throat> around the holidays, and we're going to do a top five ways how to ruin your puppy here today. First, though, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. Okay, quirky tip of the day. If you got a puppy at home, good idea is to get a Kong, fill it up with some uh, probiotic, uh, what is that stuff Like called? Yogurt. yogurt. Yogurt is a good probiotic put for it puppies. In, put it in the freezer so it gets hard. And then you can give them that thing to chew on and look on that, and it'll pacify them. And it'll help with the teething. Some of them want to chew on stuff all the time. So that's a great little tip for you if you have a puppy at home. Watch the xylitol, though, if you're going for yogurt. Get a yogurt that doesn't have any xylitol in it. Yeah, that's not good for pups. Uh, it's not good for any dogs. So what are we going on today? All right, we're going to go five to one, how you can ruin a puppy. Okay, well, let's jump right in at number five. Hang in there for number one. It's right around the corner. Number five, using pee pads. This is kind of a pet peeve for us. Good one. If you're letting your puppy pee indoors all the time on pee pads, it's going to be really difficult to start that housebreaking because they're getting comfortable peeing in the house. Uh, One um, statistics that I I looked up uh, earlier today is that up to 25% of the dogs that are relinquished to shelters are having housebreaking issues and that's why they're turned in. And also 25% of the vets that um, see these behavioral cases, it's about toilet, they call it toileting, but what we're talking about is housebreaking, dogs that are peeing in the house. And if your dog has been peeing in the house, you know, people tend to put up with it for about a year. It's been my experience. But when they finally break down and decide that they're going to replace carpets, get hardwood floors refinished, they don't want to have to do that all over again. And that's when they decide if this dog doesn't get it under control, then they're going to kick the dog to the curb, you know? And the pee pads seem good theoretically, um, especially if you have a smaller dog. But Really, smaller dogs live a very long time, fortunately, and if you're going to be picking up these pads for 18 years and, you know, cleaning up feces and urine in your house, that's your own choice. But a lot of times the pee pads start to expand. So rather than think you have this one nice little pad in your kitchen and that's where the dog is going to go and where the puppy is going to go at first and potty its whole life that kind of starts to expand to a larger and larger area. Yeah, it reminds me of a, um, a woman I went to see in San Marino. She had a nine-month-old puppy there that was peeing in the house. And when I got there, she had pee pads in every room in the house and going down the the hallway, pee pads. And she said every time the puppy just pees just off to the side of the pee pad. So then she'd put another one right beside it. But the dog would always pee just off of the pee pad. And it was really difficult to get that dog housebroken because for that particular puppy, peeing outdoors was very unnatural. I don't think it ever had peed outdoors before. So... It was a bit of a challenge, but uh, we got a handle on it. Yeah, and, you know, if it's a little dog, that's one thing. Well, a lot of people think any puppy of any size should use a pee pad. Well, that's a large amount of urine. I mean, as these dogs grow, that's a lot, and you're kind of imprinting a behavior into them that you may not want to have throughout their entire adulthood. Um, And outside of that, you're purchasing pee pads. I mean, it's just as easy to take the dog outside to go potty as... Always be purchasing something to have in your house and have them potty on. And sometimes they can get a little bit confused. Well, is that rug near the stove the pee pad? Is that towel that was left out from the gym the pee pad? You know, it can become a little bit of an issue there also. So you want to be really mindful of that. Now, if you get a little dog like a Yorkie or something and it's winter, it's going to be harder to housebreak that puppy and get the puppy to go outside because they're freezing. They have a sweater on and everything else. So be mindful of that too. Be breed specific about when you're bringing a dog into your house and season specific because it is much easier to get a puppy to go outside in the spring and in the summer if you live in a four seasoned um, part of the world than in the dead of winter when it's single digits and you don't want to be outside yourself. Well, any puppy is tough in the winter. Getting a puppy that you have to housebreak outdoors because we don't want to be standing out there in the cold for 
you know, 30, 40 minutes with a puppy trying to get them to pee either, you know. Um, the only thing I would say, you know, the exception to the rule possibly about this thing with a puppy and the pee pads is if you have to be at work and that puppy has to be, you know, alone for a long period of time, I would at least, at the very least, have a pen so you have a very limited area where that puppy can move and that's where the pee pads would be in half of that pen or something like that. Yeah, but or some people use like um, a box filled with, you know. Or a play pen, a yeah. kid's play pen, that But kind you of can thing. have a part of the pen also sectioned off for the dog to go to the bathroom. So some people put in pellets, that kind of thing. But be mindful of the habits that you're creating right when the puppy comes home. And some breeders say, oh, go out and get this brand of pee pads and you have friends and family that have used them before. And it's everyone's personal choice, obviously, but you have to realize that that could be a 10 to 15 to 20 year commitment of you having these things in your house, cleaning up after them, throwing them out. And frankly, I don't want to be touching urine and feces day in, day out for the rest of my life. It's very different cleaning up a yard with a pooper scooper every other day than really having to be mindful of not having this waste in your house. So yeah, be if, thoughtful of if that. If you have children too, I mean, it becomes a real hygiene issue. You got little kids running around barefoot, they're walking in pee, they're stepping on these pee pads. And uh, so think about the hygienic issue too, you know? Yeah. So be thoughtful about that. Um, of course, go with what works best for you. But the fifth way, in our opinion, to ruin a puppy is to start them on pee pads. Yeah, let them pee in the house for that whole first year of their life. You'll be off to a great start. <laughs> no, really. It, it seems theoretically like, oh, we'll just wean off the pee pads. But it's hard because that's what they're used to doing. The sooner they know to go to the door, go outside, and you know, I do my business, and then I get to come back in and eat and have water and play and everything else, the quicker it all comes together. And I'll say lastly, just because Cesar Milan put his face on the side of a package of pee pads <laughs> doesn't mean it's the best choice. <laughs> all right. Fourth way to ruin your puppy, carrying your puppy everywhere. What's wrong with that, Jess? <laughs> well, the bigger dogs you can't carry for that long anyway. That gets to be a little bit of a sad thing. But um, this especially is a little dog thing, it seems, again, too. They kind of get this, um, this complex almost because you're always picking them up and always carrying them, and then they act like they're real big dogs in your arms. So carrying your puppy has a few negative effects, but... The first and foremost is those little dogs especially tend to be more reactive in your arms. Yeah, and one of the other things is a lot of people wind up carrying their puppy around because their puppy won't walk on a leash. You know, they put the they don't put the leash and the collar on the puppy until they have to use it outdoors. And then the puppy freezes up when there's a little bit of tension on that line. And the people have to get somewhere, so they just scoop the puppy up and carry the puppy. So the puppy's learning... They don't have to walk on a leash, and if they freeze up and resist, they'll get picked up, which is rewarding to the dog. So there's many, many reasons why carrying a puppy around is not a great idea. Um, you're also not allowing the dog to get used to different surfaces and, and new environments and all that stuff. It's always being coddled and protected in your arms. Yeah, you may not know that going from carpet to tile is an issue <coughs> until your puppy actually has to walk on the different surfaces when they're actually on the ground moving around. And um, one thing that is really different is having the puppy meet people in your arms versus on the ground. So you want to be mindful of what that picture is going to look like their entire life. And if you're just kind of shoving them into people's chests and, oh, pet my puppy and see my puppy, well, six months from now, it's going to look a lot different when someone's hovering over the puppy. So be mindful of how you're doing introductions and what the puppy's learning and how they're getting comfortable meeting other people. And you don't want to just be their security blanket that's their little um, go-between of, oh, I don't know this person and, oh, mommy said this person is nice. Yeah, another thing, I, you know, I said if the puppy doesn't walk on a leash, they get picked up. That's a pretty common issue. But another thing to keep in mind is every time there's a problem, people will pick up that puppy. So if the puppy starts barking, you know, and, and being embarrassing maybe to the owner, they'll pick the puppy up. There's a million reasons why people pick the puppies up. Usually it's because the puppy is exhibiting some type of uh, negative behavior. And that picking up, keep in mind, is reinforcing. It's kind of rewarding to the dog, even though that's not the intention, typically, of the owner. Yeah. And now, listen, we totally get it. Like, if you're going to bring the puppy to the vet and everything else, we're not saying, oh, the puppy needs to walk on the ground and every surface and all that stuff. There's a lot of contagious stuff at the vet's office. If I have a young puppy, I don't even potty my puppies in the yard of the vet's office. I'll stop a block before or go across the street or something else. Same thing with older dogs with weaker immune systems. I'm very thoughtful of that. And we would highly, highly, highly recommend you carry your puppy for as long as you can 
from the car into the vet's office and everything else. We're not crazy. We're not saying there's never a purpose to carry the puppy and it doesn't have a meaningful job as the puppy's growing older. However, if you're just doing it as a routine and also you have to think it's reinforcing for you to have a puppy in your arms and pet the puppy and everything else. So if you're just doing it 24 seven out of habit, then that's where you're going to see the fallout. Okay. But of course, when you're going to a new place with you know, other things that could possibly be communicable diseases or a spot where the puppy could pick up some, you know, rocks or glass or something unsafe. Obviously you're going to pick your puppy up in those instances, but just don't make it the norm when the puppy comes home till whenever you can't carry the puppy anymore because it's grown up too large. Yeah, no, I I think it makes perfect sense. I don't see the point in getting a, you know, a little, these little packs that people are carrying the puppy around (laughs) in and all these kind of things, little purses, you know, uh, they're fashionable, but it's not helping your puppy. And when you have a little dog, like we said, it just is, seems to be carried then into all of eternity. So just be thoughtful of these things because what habits you're creating those first few weeks and those first few months are going to kind of carry over into the puppy's life. And it's going to be harder and harder to break these things as time goes on. So number three, well, I just want to say just lastly with carrying the puppy, a lot of people carry the puppies around cause they really enjoy it. You know, it's not about the dog being reactive or problematic on the ground. They just enjoy carrying that puppy all the time. So try to balance that out. I know that it's great to have a new puppy. They're awesome. They're a lot of fun. They're fun to show people and interact with, but try to balance all that stuff out. Don't just carry them everywhere you go, especially those toy breeds because they're like Napoleons. You know, they they get to they act like a real big dog in a tiny body, and it's because they get treated special. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so five, four, going to three. The third way you can surefire ruin a puppy is by improper puppy socialization. And at first, we we're going to call this lack of socialization, but then really it kind of turned into improper because there's ways that you can over-socialize or poorly socialize also, not just uh, not socialize at all. Yeah, I mean, one example is if you've taken your your puppy to the vet for boosters, you know, shortly after you get the puppy, and the puppy uh, throws up in the car, starts drooling, gets car sick, has a big problem with driving in the car. So you stop taking the dog in the car because you think, oh, the dog doesn't like it, the dog gets sick. Well, now all of a sudden that dog's world is not expanding the way it should be. The dog needs to be getting out, this puppy needs to get out and see a lot of stuff. And uh, you got to work through some of these issues. And if you don't, you know, it's it's kind of hard to make up that lost time once your puppy gets to be a year, year and a half old. Yeah, even though it's easier sometimes to keep the dog home or not have to deal with it, you want to think of the greater good of the situation. And along with that car sick point, this is probably a good quirky tip at some point, but I'll share it today. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bonus tip. Um, the ginger snap cookies from Trader Joe's um, are really good sometimes yeah, are, if you have a puppy that gets car sick, not for the human, but I for no the dog. I have no problem. I eat a box of those. Yeah, no, I know you don't. But the, the ginger sometimes helps their stomach. But you want to work through those things as quickly as possible. And not only with getting them out of the house and getting them in a car, but get them away from the property. Like, I, it's crazy to us how many people will go to their house, the dog's 8 months, 12 months, 18 months old, They've never left the property. They have very rarely met other people besides the immediate family members. I mean, it's scary. The dogs are just like shell-shocked because there's new things being introduced into their environments. And a lot of people don't have a lot of company. So now with the caveat of Amazon coming to the door and knocking on the door and someone being home and the puppy seeing someone outside of the house, the puppy's world is very small and limited. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say is that obviously a puppy doesn't have any manners. They don't have any obedience training, but they're not that big. So you can get away with them pulling on the leash and acting silly when they're three, four, five months old, and you're still getting them out everywhere. But if you wait and then you try to address this when they're now 10, 12 months old, and they could possibly be anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds, now it's a much bigger issue for you to walk down the street because they don't have any obedience training because you haven't done anything with them. And they're pulling you and they're, you know, it's, it's a more concerning issue. And it's, there's a lot more complications that tend to arise from having a big dog that has fear, no o- obedience, and all that other stuff. Yeah, and know? with that said, if the dog's never been outside of the house before and you're walking down the street and it freezes up, it's really hard to get a 60-pound puppy to come with you because now you're pulling a lot of weight behind you. And this is all kind of lack of socialization stuff. The other way that you can look at it is improper socialization. So a lot of people say, okay, we're going to have the puppy meet everything and everyone, and it's going to be awesome. But 
we would not recommend that your puppy meet every single dog that you come into contact with. When we get puppies, we have a very small circle of dogs that we know are friendly with other animals. And the puppy meets that. We make sure the dog's social. And then from there on out, we just kind of say, oh, yeah, we're working with the puppy. It's good to see you. Because if you have a bad situation with a young puppy, with a dog that you don't know how it reacts to other dogs on the street, that can be a lifelong problem. Yeah, and the likelihood of a bad problem arising goes way up with the more dogs you that you don't know that you introduce your puppy to. You know, I mean, not all dogs are friendly, and uh, sometimes it could be a dog that's not unfriendly, but just could be too rough with your dog in playing and, and hurt your dog or scare your, your puppy, and, and that's no good either, you know? Yeah, and it goes with people too. So we are talking about... Um, you know, don't carry your puppy everywhere. Don't let people say hi to your puppy when it's always in your arms and everything else. But if your puppy is constantly meeting people on the ground and then getting its front feet off of the ground and touching someone to get praise and love from other people, and you're trying to get it to meet as many kids and adults and seniors and everything that you can, because you're trying to do the right thing. Well, then in six months, that's what you're going to get also. So, you know, either step on the dog's leash so the dog can't be raising its front paws or have people get down low to the dog's level, but be mindful of these things because whatever habits you're creating, they're going to carry forward into the rest of the dog's life, or at least they're going to be harder to break as they go from puppyhood to adulthood. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty standard or typical that people would come into our facility with a young dog that has a terrible jumping problem, uh, runs away from them whenever it sees another dog, wants to go play with the other dog, and it's from the puppy getting rewarded externally and also getting rewarded for a lot of negative behavior for the first year of its life. And now it's become unacceptable. And you got to now, they bring, they bring the dog to someone like us, to a dog trainer and say, okay, you guys have to change the rules for us because we've allowed all this negative behavior and now you have to fix it. So it's much easier to have a little bit of a strategy with a young puppy than to just let the puppy do whatever it wants and then trying to fix it all a year later, you know? Yeah. And repetition is what's building behavior. And that's what you're going to see as the dog grows up. So number five way to ruin a puppy is using pee pads. The fourth way you can ruin your puppy is carrying your puppy everywhere. And the third way you can ruin your puppy is improper socialization. We're going to get two and one out to you when we get back after the break. Does your dog lack self-control? Are you looking for some answers? Would you like your dog to be calmer? Does your dog lack confidence? Canine MindShift. Enroll in a free course today. Simply go to caninemindshift.com. That's caninemindshift.com. I'll do it. All right. I'm excited about it. <laughs> All right. Number two is one that you like. You talked about this on the Facebook video. I did briefly. Did a little, little video on this. So, um, the second out of five ways of um, ruining your puppy is giving your puppy too much freedom. And we've touched on this a little bit uh, up to this point, but one of the craziest things that I see with people that would bring puppies into my facility for training <laughs> is that they couldn't stand still with their puppy on a leash. If the puppy wanted to run over to the left, the man would go over to the left. And if the puppy wanted to run to the right to the trash can, the guy would move quickly over to the right, making sure that that leash never got tight and they never restricted the movement of that puppy. It's kind of crazy. I mean, <laughs> I don't understand why this you know, 12 pound puppy is dragging these people or these people are just hustling behind them everywhere the puppy wants to go. I mean, I think that maybe that's a, a warped way of thinking the dog needs to see everything. And what happens is the puppy becomes accustomed to doing whatever it wants, whenever it wants. And then when you finally have to put some brakes on, because maybe now the puppy's trying to get into something poisonous, now you have a big problem. They start protesting and it gets to be ugly. And it's, you know, you need to just kind of establish at that point that that you're in charge of the puppy and and it's it doesn't mean you have to be harsh or anything but just establish a little bit of structure you know yeah restricting movement for a puppy when it's out and about in the world is not a bad thing to do it's just keeping it within a specified area and keeping the puppy safer and everything else so 
be really mindful of that because yeah, I mean, it even happens sometimes with the adult dogs, you know, um, women would come in that worked out plenty with this, you know, six pound Yorkie and the Yorkie would stop behind them and they acted like their arm was going to get pulled off because the dog wanted to stop moving. So it kind of, again, transcends into the rest of the dog's life. And this is kind of what the dog's used to doing is completely controlling you on a leash. And like Scott said, if they're dragging towards the street, you most likely aren't going to just let them walk into the street and follow behind them then. So it shouldn't be just commonplace to say, oh, if the dog or the puppy wants to see this, I need to let it happen because they need to do what they want to do and they need to explore their environment and all this. And the the answer doesn't mean you stand in place but get a 15-foot flexi leash <laughs> so that it can continue to go away from you and come back as it wants to. Another area is in the house. So I have a note here that you shouldn't let the puppy out of your sight when you're in the home with this puppy. So what that means is if you're in the kitchen with your puppy, ideally you would have gates up so that the puppy can't leave that room if you're in there working, making a meal or something like that, because things happen so quick. If that puppy goes out of the kitchen into around a corner, for one, they could pee and poop, you wouldn't see it. Uh, the other thing that's more likely is that they're gonna chew through some computer cords. They're gonna get into trouble, they're gonna chew up a remote control, they're going to do a lot of puppy stuff. That's what they do. But if you're not there to supervise, they could swallow stuff that could kill them. They're certainly going to damage the property. And they're getting repetitions of just doing a lot of negative behavior that you're going to have to try and fix. And the way you'll try and fix it later is by then trying to keep them in a crate. And then, of course, they're going to protest the crate because they've never seen a crate before. And it just starts to spiral downhill, you know? Yeah. And even if you think, oh, well, the bathroom's safe. The puppy will be fine in the bathroom. Well, we've had clients that the dogs go around the corner in the bathroom and then they're drinking out of the toilet because the toilet's water or they think, oh, what is this? Something fun. And all of a sudden you have a puppy in the toilet. Like you just want to be thoughtful of these things. Puppies are little terrors and they can get into a lot of trouble in a short amount of time. And the less trouble that they get into in the first six months of their life, the easier road you're going to have to live with this dog for its entirety of its life. Because if you're getting a lot of potty training trouble and a lot of destructive behavior and a lot of jumping and a lot of barking and a lot of protesting the crate, and you don't address that early on, it's only going to haunt you for years to come. Yeah. And another thing, like this is the complete uh, antithesis of giving the puppy too much freedom, and that's implementing a little structure and routine. So you need to establish some structure and routine. And, and I mean having the puppy eat at a certain time, some crate training, just some routines that this puppy gets used to that are your routines that you're creating for the puppy. And uh, the opposite of that is just letting the puppy do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. And uh, they're not going to be happy. And um, they're going to do a lot of stuff that you don't like. And it's going to become bad habits for them as an adult dog. Yeah. And you got to be thoughtful of the kids. A lot of people say, oh, the kids are watching the puppy. Everything will be fine. Well, the kids aren't watching the puppy. You know, they get sidetracked with something else and everything. So it's your responsibility to make sure the puppy doesn't have too much freedom. And I think the biggest topic on this issue, um, before we get to the number one reason how you can ruin your puppy is not using a crate. I mean, it is crazy how often people say, oh, well, the puppy didn't like the crate. So we stopped using the crate or, you know, oh, it did well in the crate, you know, during housebreaking and then we didn't use it anymore. And then we'll say, well, why'd you get rid of it? Oh, well, yeah, it started crying at night and it didn't want the crate. Just because your puppy says, oh, I don't like the crate anymore. I want to be out with the family or something else. You should still have them accustomed to being in a crate, being created at home while you're home, being created away from the home, being created at home while you go out. Dogs should accept these things because it makes them more well-rounded and it gives you a lot of freedom moving forward. Scott and I often will take our dogs to a concert or something that's a state away over the weekend. We'll just take a couple of our dogs and have a dog sitter for the other ones. We just bring crates, put them in the hotel. The dogs are all set. They're quiet. They're comfortable. And then we can go hiking the next day or something after the show. So be thoughtful of these things because these things seem like simple things and battles that you don't need to deal with. But if you work through them, you're going to be set up for a much easier road ahead for the entirety of the dog's life rather than just the quick fix when it's a puppy and you don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Sometimes with the crating, you know, you can compare it to ferberizing a baby. I mean, they're going to protest in the beginning and that's okay. You know, let them have their little tantrum or whatever it is and they will settle in really quickly. I mean, within a few days, you know, one, one of the most difficult puppies I ever had, 
Within three days, he was absolutely fine in the crate. But the first night, he was like the Tasmanian the devil. The, the crate was like moving around the kitchen floor. It was like just shuffling around the floor because he was slamming his body into it and stuff like that. But, I mean, I've had people tell me that the puppy cries in the crate, so they sleep on the floor with their hand through the bars of the crate so that the puppy can touch their hand so that the puppy doesn't cry. And that's just dragging a, a problem out. I mean, it's just never going to get better, you know, because when the hell do you get to go back to bed? You know, what they'll do is they'll sleep on the floor next to the crate for a month or something, and then they'll abandon the crate because they never actually got the puppy comfortable sleeping in a crate. Yeah. Scott's kind of bleeding over into the number one way to ruin What's the puppy. What's the number one way? I don't even know. I want to your... give another tip here oh. because now I'm feeling all tipped out today. Um, so if your puppy does hate the crate, and one thing that you should really consider doing is feeding its meals in the crate. So if your puppy's crying and all upset about being in the crate, well, every time you give it its structured, measured amount of food, feed it in the crate. Isn't the crate too small to feed a puppy? Oh, in? don't start with me. Okay. <laughs> Number one way to ruin your puppy is to never leave your puppy alone. So Scott touched on this just a little bit with the sleeping, but this is like a thing, guys. Like this is becoming a real problem here. Well, one of the reasons it's becoming a problem is because there's a lot of people that are able to actually work from home now. And that wasn't the case even 10 years ago. But there are so many people now that are full-time employed, but from home on the computer. So they get this puppy and they think it's great. I work from home. I can raise this puppy. It's no problem. And it is great that you work from home and it is great that you can take the puppy out, you know, every few hours to go potty and get that house breaking under control. The problem is they tend to have that puppy glued to their leg all day long, every day, seven days a week. And if they have to go out, there's a spouse or there's someone else with that puppy and the puppy never learns how to live alone. And that's a problem we have, you know, with people these days too. Nobody gets any alone time. Everybody is either with somebody or on their phone. But uh, with the puppies, it's good to teach them how to be a little bit independent. You know, we don't want them to be inconsolable and develop the separation anxiety. And the thing is, you don't even notice it. I mean, we've had clients that get up at five in the morning and take their dog to yoga with them and go here and go there. And that's great. But you need to balance these things. It's like, we, I like to have my dog uh, in bed with us at night and sleep um, at the foot of the bed. But not every night, you know, because um, I don't want him to have, you know, be upset if he can't do that, you know. So we try to balance all these things out so that they can do things, that, but it's all on our terms. It's not what they want to do when they want to do it. You yeah, know? and you want them to just take everything in stride. And there are even some um, companies now we're reading that will actually give you t paid time off when you get a puppy, which is great, theoretically. Like, that's great. Like, we have problems with maternity leave, but, you know, you get a puppy, spend some time, let the puppy, puppy acclimate. If that's something that your company offers or you have a friend that offers that, I know Nina Hale in uh, Minnesota, it's a marketing company. They're a company that uses this practice. Practice leaving the house also. Don't just stay there for the seven days looking at the puppy. And it sounds insane, but we have had multiple families over the years say, Oh, like, yeah, I really, I don't think in four years the dog's ever been left alone. And you think, well, how does that develop? Well, some people have extended family that lives there. So if, you know, the seniors, there, yeah, yeah, if the couple goes out for dinner with the kids, then grandma and grandpa are still there or an aunt will come over and watch the puppy. Like this is literally happening. Like people are, the dog has not been unattended in a house for years at a time. So the sooner you get the dog used to being alone, enjoying its alone time, and being comfortable in its own skin being alone, the better prepared it's going to be for the rest of its life. Yeah, the nice thing about this is that this is foundational stuff we're talking about with a puppy. So if you do these things and you don't, you know, ruin your puppy, then later all the rules can change, but foundationally the dog is okay. You know, if you have an older dog now and you're home every day, all day long, and the the dog's home with you, it's it's great. But then you can't be there. The dog doesn't fall apart because it had plenty of time without you there too. So it's just nice if you can also think about what your life may be like a year down the road when you get this puppy and you want to try to create this lifestyle that maybe you're aiming towards with that puppy also. Because, you know, just because you're home, you know, you might be on maternity leave and you get this puppy, whatever the case is, 
then you're going to be going back to work. And then all of a sudden there's a big problem with your puppy. No, you want your puppy to be able to adapt just like you want your kids to be able to adapt. It's important that puppies deal with the world and deal with what's thrown at them. And they just take it all in stride because it's better for their immune systems. It's better for your stress level. And it's better for the whole temperature of the house, really. What are we doing next week, Jess? Oh, you want to talk about next week already, huh? All right. Next week, we're going to mention fear in dogs. We're going to do a little podcast on fear. And if you need anything from us or have any feedback, shoot us an email at studio at the quirky dog.com and keep it quirky in the meantime. Peace. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.